Hi, so it's great to be here. I'm not going to sum up all the excellent things that the speakers uh, before me have just said, except for I, I agree with them fundamentally. Uh, the work that we do at Terraform One is, uh, here we go, uh, is in some ways thinking about uh, the future, allowing the importance of imagination or ideas to affect uh, cities. And, and I think that I can make a great kind of case in point uh, about the kind of power of imagination. If we didn't have someone like Jules Verne, uh, on an island in Paris, uh, dreaming about getting to the moon, and then writing a very uh, kind of concise, fictive narrative of how he would get there. Uh, may, I think those engineers at NASA would have a very difficult time when John F. Kennedy said, look, there's Sputnik, we've got to get to the moon. It's so actually that, that kind of imagination and creativity is the first thing those engineers look towards. They actually took piece by piece Jules Verne's narrative about getting to the moon, which is a stage rocket leaving from a peninsula, decouples when it gets out of the atmosphere, uh, the booster rockets fall down, there's a lunar landing module that gets, uh, that kind of uh, falls into the moon, then that, that uh, turns to a capsule, comes back, penetrates the atmosphere, ocean landing, and then military pickup uh, by the Navy. And was that, that kind of fictive narrative and speculation, I think, kind of drives our work. And we do that in a collective. This is uh, one of the, the kind of views of a future city that we produced for uh, Popular Science magazine. Uh, we work not as a, a, a kind of elite architects and planners, but we invite a whole myriad of folks, kind of a rainbow of people, to our group. We usually design things with about 40 people at the table, uh, all different kinds of, of skill sets. So it's very interdisciplinary, from poets to artists to people that work at a grocery store to uh, planners. And we come up with simple memes or concepts to approach a neighborhood or an aspect of the city that those people have uh, invested in or live there. Uh, so this would be a simple grammar for reversing the figure ground or replacing streets uh, with buildings and where the buildings used to be, adding in this green space, but green space that's productive for waste, food, water, energy, the kind of things that make up cities. And we'll do background analysis before these players come to the table. So we'll look at all the conditions of the site, uh, demographics and history, et cetera. We'll divide them up into quadrants and we'll create a physical model where for about three to four months, those folks act on a, a kind of a, a singular place or, or, or on that table, move pieces around or design them to think about what the neighborhood should be or, or, or what it would be like if we can imagine the best possibility of that scenario. Now some might think, hey, that's utopia. And what good is utopia? Well, utopia is kind of a maximal answer to a real world problem. It's kind of like a, a base vision. You may never get there, but it's kind of important to have some, some directive or some sensibility. It's like going to the gym and having no idea what a healthy body might be. Like I might go to the gym and think that I want to look just like Beckham. That would be a goal. It won't ever happen, but that, that would be a kind of directive. Someone else might think Schwarzenegger. I would say it's crazy, but at least there is something in place. So we produce these models of various neighborhoods so that folks have that kind of vision. And it's a 100 or 50 year vision, depending where it is. And then we kind of create programs from that. We refine it. This one we did for the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which dealt with uh, 300 acres of unused space in an old industrial area in the city of New York, uh, all along the waterfront. We reused the dry docks. A lot of these ideas were cultivated from the folks that were a part of this project. Uh, it's actually, here's a, one of these office towers, clean tech office towers in, uh, in the area, and then other zones for uh, the study of liminology and ecological restoration, community centers, market, et cetera, housing uh, in that particular zone. And then kind of bigger pictures about what that future city might be. And this, this is where it gets kind of uh, really interesting to us. And if you think back throughout the history of cities, uh, they were centered around well, ecclesiastical structures, structures of spirituality, like a cathedral would be the center of cities in the past. And then if you kind of skip to the present, uh, the centers of cities now are the kind of the downtown, kind of commercial skyscrapers, the semiotic pulse of capitalism makes up those kinds of centers. And we're thinking the center of the future city, uh, the city or the next city, what it might be, uh, is, is certainly not going to be cathedrals, nothing wrong with religion, or uh, you know, downtown skyscrapers or capitalism, but might be uh, the stuff of life, the metabolism that keeps us alive, keeps us breathing, keeps our waste, food, energy, et cetera, communications working. That center might be the net, or net as center. It would be infrastructure as spectacle. People would be proud of something like a waste to energy plant, which is one of the nodes in this kind of net shown here. And that to us would be the kind of directive for the future city, certainly something very different than we thought of before. And we think in, as a group, and there's a name for this interdisciplinary group, 
Uh, it's called an urban ear. It's basically what you get if uh, Jane Jacobs had sex with Robert Moses. Kind of get the perfect combination of, of kind of both worlds. Uh, we like to think Frederick Olmsted was one such a, a example as the love child between the two of them. Uh, and, and here's a, 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 a more recent project that we just completed uh, this summer, thinking just like urban ears, coming together, 40 of us at a table, working at this model, best case scenarios, maximal ideas, then make it into a very cogent program after that was done. Analysis predetermined beforehand, this was looking at Governor's Island and the indigent community of Red Hook in Brooklyn and combining the two of them with a the riparian corridor. So we kind of diminish the size of the river with gabions, create an ecological preserve, soften the edge, and connect the two. One would be a center of culture and one would be a new center of housing, creating a triangle between Brooklyn Heights, Ikea, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Governor's Island. And there is another view of it here. And uh, working at all scales, because I don't think urban designers need to just work at the scale of cities. In fact, so many interesting things are said when you're working on a city that it's, it's, it's all encompassing. So one of the other projects that I did when I was uh, doing my doctorates at MIT was thinking about the future of the car. Or actually, the future of the car was a little bit boring uh, because, well, you know, you've, after five years, people get tired of it. So we want to think about bigger questions that would contribute to this knowledge about mobility in cities. And that question was, uh, you know, the, the entire 20th century had been developed around the automobile. Why not find an automobile that fits the city? So that was my thesis. So here's a car called the Hug and Kiss Lamb car. Uh, it's super soft. It's designed with air bladders within air bladders. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't need to go faster than 35 miles an hour. It's designed for the specific context of cities themselves. It moves in flocks and herds. It's incredibly lightweight. All of the design for the vehicle is actually inside the wheel, drivetrain, suspension, motoring. Uh, and if, you know, if it hits your sister, uh, it would tickle her. It wouldn't kill her. The principle here would be that no one will ever die in a car accident again. So that was our first design principle. Here they are kind of being adapted to existing grids. You can imagine these cars move in, in flocks and herds. When they find a Hummer on the road, they cluster around it and move it off to the side as they kind of take over the streets. <laughs> They also detect potholes, but we've had enough talk about that today. I agree with it. It's important. And then we, we actually uh, have produced one just a couple of months ago, Hiroko, which is uh, a, a, a variation of this city car, car designed for a city. Uh, it's now available, designed with, uh, uh, well, in the Basque countryside in Spain with, with Korean money. Uh, so it took about 10 years to get something like that to happen. And then other projects that, that rethink uh, the entire system of building one that is as green as possible, that is completely self-sufficient. So here's a technology that's 2,500 years old. It's called pleaching, or grafting inosculate matter to form one contiguous uh, system. Uh, you can use woody plants to do it. We made a house that is the landscape. Landscape and house do not have any difference except for the inside. I think this is a very different view of, of organic architecture than we're, than we're used to. It's something that, uh, you know, as an architect, it's been great to have a project like this. I, get all kinds of letters from all over the world, certainly snarky comments from people who are anonymous, great, uh, and a lot of positive uh, affect and posture from others, including little kids who send me these letters saying they want their parents to stop polluting, they want to live in a treehouse just like this, and they want to grow up to be an architect just like me. And I'm fine with the first two, just the last one, I think maybe they, they can work for uh, JP Morgan or something where they make a little money in their life. Uh, anyway, so we, we, the only problem with these is a, bit, uh, is a modicum of time. It takes, a, it takes some time to grow these. You can grow an entire village or pre-plant them for thousands of families, not with a zero contribution to the landscape or to the metabolism of the earth, but with a positive contribution to the earth. It's something that returns or is accountable for the amount of pollution that we've already done and helps scrub or clean the air. Uh, you do have to wait for it. That's what I was talking about before, <laughs> modicum of time. Uh, we don't use genetic modification in this case, but in about seven to 10 years, you can get a home grown at this scale. We've been testing it uh, since 2002. We have all sorts of examples, and there are many built versions on the web that uh, I could gladly point you to or pointed to on our website. And then finally, uh, well not finally, but we have been getting a lot of comments about where the, you know, the kind of veggie house people, uh, someone really must be aggressive or angry or something said, you know, why don't you try and make a meat house? And I <laughs> thought, idea, you know, brilliant. Uh, uh, my uh, roommate at Harvard, uh, Dr. Oliver Medvedic was at the medical school. We, uh, we had been thinking about where biology and architecture actually mix, and we had, uh, Oliver had a student working on this project where you can print geometry from extracellular matrix of pigs into any shape. 
And we thought, well, what can we, what can we do with this? Let's start thinking of a new kind of uh, industrial design procedure. One of the things you do do is you replace bladders uh, in patients who have uh, you know, prostate cancer. You can replace cartilage in a knee. Uh, you may have seen a New York Times article just a couple of weeks ago about uh, printing organs. Uh, certainly, you can't print the vascular systems. They, they have issues with immunology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're not perfect, but what they are is tissue engineered uh, into very exact uh, uh, compositions that can be made into uh, leather belts or shoes, handbags, or other, other concepts besides just uh, ones you'd find in regenerative medicine. So we looked at, you know, could we build a house like this? And if I haven't uh, kind of designed and built a biohacker space in New York City, I wouldn't have known the different tools and the systems in place to do bench work to make like, something like this real. This was, I guess, our idea of organic architecture, not your grandpa's version of organic architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright, I love very much, but it's all glass and steel, brilliant, fine. Now we're thinking about we can actually tweak components in nature, actually at the smallest possible level, level and find all kinds of things that we can grow and make. We did this project, which will lead to the, the next project that I have not shown before, so you'll see it. But here is a, a kind of a wall section produced for the house of meat. I had no idea how to think what would be the tectonic elements that make up a house of meat. Uh, there's a famous Lewis Kahn lecture about what does a brick want to be. I have no idea what a meat cell wants to be. But here you can see is, uh, you know, a typical stud wall house on your right, and then the kind of meat solution on the left, where we use fatty cells for insulation, cilia for wind loads, and sphincter muscles for doors and windows. This is what it looks like. It could be designed to be anything. This is the section that we grew. What's important is we don't design it to stay alive. We design it to be curated sulfates and nitrates, like beef jerky or leather. It, it can be curated to exact geometry and stay uh, on the shelf for years without having any effect. Uh, works. We did a project in, uh, in, in Prague where we put the meat house in front of the cathedral so religion can confront it. <laughs> I get invited back to Prague every year uh, to do shows. I think it's basically, I always show that slide. I think they don't speak English or something. I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, and then working with uh, trash or waste materials and seeing how we can convert them biologically into new systems or new tectonic elements for building. This is the typical dumb bricks you'd find uh, uh, or dumb bales that are made by these machines uh, anywhere on the planet Earth. Uh, here is one thing that we can do to communicate to the everyday American the amount of waste we produce. So here is a Statue of Liberty. This is one hour of trash in the city of New York. Around 38,000 tons of trash is produced. We use this kind of uh, bale making system to produce tectonic to show uh, uh, how we can uh, um, explain to Americans the amount of waste we make. And using that same waste, we can also grow it. Grow it into systems here are mycelium or what, the root base of mushrooms. Uh, we did this for a project for the Museum of Contemporary Art, showing that we could grow it uh, from waste into something that would uh, be absolutely usable, like uh, this mycelium system. Uh, Ecobative is a company that we're licensed with. This is showing you the mycelium is wrapped in aluminum for other purposes, shearing forces, et cetera, showing it in a what we call 24-hour tower. So if we had the Statue of Liberty as one hour of waste, uh, in 24 hours, we can make a 53-story skyscraper every day in the city of New York with the amount of waste that we produce. We certainly tweak it biologically and tweak the machines that we have today to do it. And then finally, the last project, which we just did for the Genetic Engineering Machines Conference, or iGEM, uh, is uh, an, a thing that we grew at full scale. It's meant to be usable at, by anybody. It's, uh, we're calling it Gen 2 Seat. We want to make it very obvious about the purpose of genetic engineering and synthetic biology and what designers can do when they sit down with scientists every day. Uh, and explain that to you know, someone like Homer Simpson of where synthetic biology might be doing some good for the world. Uh, so here is what we have, the kind of the 19th century chair, uh, which is kind of the subject we decide to take, because uh, everyone understands what a chair is. The 20th, uh, 20, 20th century chair, Charles and Ray Eames, kind of perfect mid-century modernism, really can't change what they've done with materials. And then finally, the kind of the genetic engineered chair, which is we're just at the cusp of understanding this, but this one we got. So it's pretty cool. That's our lab. We work with Genspace. Uh, I can't tell you who's a scientist in that picture. We all wear purple gloves and lab coats. Not every day, but when we're in there. This is the different components we use. The same mycelial, uh, syst mycelium system that I showed you before, the root base of mushrooms, combined with acetobacter, where we expressed chitin genetically, so kind of uh, you know, like fingernails or shells of insects, uh, uh, and combine those two materials creating a novel biopolymers. Kind of architects were just thinking plywood, that's what we wanted, and we produced uh, this. This is showing it grows in seven days. Does it in our lab, can grow to any size, size of the stage, not a problem. 
This is the, aceto, the uh, acetobacter, or basically the, the, ba the cellulosic bacteria combined with the mushroom systems. And this is the geometries, the computational geometries we built out for the seat. It has a little wiggle room. It looks like a coccyx. Uh, uh, it's kind of a, you know, a, a, uh, it, can, it can, this is the seat itself. You can add them together to form a kiva or a snake-like uh, system. And this is the kind of the final slide, which is my daughter actually sitting on this uh, genetically produced uh, and designed seat that we produced in our, our, our hacker space and lab in Brooklyn. Uh, I think you know, that when you think about cities, everything is important at all scales. I don't know exactly what we're going to do with genetic engineering or synth biology in cities, but not to study it would be a mistake. I think it contributes to that kind of grand wall of knowledge. It adds yet another brick, and we're still thinking about it. So you're welcome to come to our space in Brooklyn and check out what we're doing. I think I'm, I'm out of time, but thank you very much for, for listening.